In Ecuador, the National Assembly discussed in its plenary session the situation of insecurity the country is facing, while three provinces remain in a state of emergency. Leaders from all over the world take part in the 27th Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as COP27. In Spain, doctors coming out of hospital emergencies in the community of Madrid got on definite strike. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Desert Studio in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Ecuador, the National Assembly discussed in its plenary session the situation of insecurity the country is facing, while three provinces remain in a state of emergency. According to the schedule of the legislative body, the meeting took place during the 809th and ninth session of the plenary session, as announced by the President of the Legislature, Virgilio Saquicela, the meeting came six days after the government of President Guillermo Lasso issued a state of emergency in the provinces of Guayaquil and Esmeraldas and was later extended to Santo Domingo de los Tachilas a few days ago. The President of the National Assembly participated in the Council of Public and State Security along with the Head of State as well as the commanders of the National Police and Armed Forces, among others. The Ecuadorian Public Health Ministry said on Monday that so far 28 people have died from bootleg liquor poisoning while 86 others remain in critical condition. In a press relief, the ministry reported that in the province of Esmeraldas, 14 people died while the rest were recorded in Santo Domingo de los Sachilas. The institution added that the number of people suffering from methyl alcohol intoxication reached 85 and all of them have been treated in public health facilities. Authorities stated they continue to monitor and investigate the cases of mass intoxication around the country. In Nicaragua, the counting of votes in the municipal elections continue. Nearly 4 million citizens were eligible to vote. The Supreme Electoral Council has the authority in charge of organizing and controlling the electoral process in the country presented the first results of this Sunday's elections in which more than 3 million Nicaraguans cast their ballots to elect more than 100 mayors and deputy mayors as well as over 5,000 councillors. The president of the Supreme Electoral Council, Brenda Rocha, highlighted the election as a democratic and sovereign exercise where the will of citizens was expressed in a transparent, democratic and peaceful manner. We have successfully concluded, thank God, a democratic and sovereign exercise where the will of citizens was expressed in a transparent, democratic and peaceful manner at the ballots. The Secretary General of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America People's Trade Treaty, Sacha Llorenti, congratulated the people and institutions of Nicaragua for holding the municipal elections. In a message published in his Twitter account, the Secretary General of Alba TCP described the elections as a democratic day where 153 mayors and councillors were elected for those municipalities. The regional body highlighted deep democratic vocation of the Nicaraguan people, establishing peace over the cause for violence and destabilization. Llorenti extended his best wishes for the success of the Central American country as it continues to advance in economic growth and social transformations based on greater inclusion, justice and equity. The President of Mexico, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, announced on Monday that he will hold a meeting in Mexico City with several Latin American leaders between November 23rd and the 25th to discuss the integration of the Americas. According to the head of state, the meeting was scheduled to be held in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca with presidents of the Pacific Alliance, which includes Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, but for logistical reasons, the venue will be changed to Mexico City. In this regard, the presidents of Chile, Gabriel Boris of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez of Ecuador, Guillermo Lasso of Peru, Pedro Castillo of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, will participate. I will also add that the confirmation of the recently elected president of Brazil, Lula Silva, is still awaited. Let's take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok at the account at Tell Us of English, in which you'll be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us.
Welcome back to From the South. In Egypt, world leaders participate in the COP27 Climate Summit. This edition incorporates for the first time the proposal to compensate developing nations for damages associated with climate change. Egyptian authorities arranged for the attendees to be received by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and Hotel Fatah al-Sisi, President of Egypt. According to the organization, during the days of Monday and Tuesday, over 100 heads of states of government from all over the world will address the COP27 plenary with special relevance from Africa. On behalf of Latin America, the President of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro of Colombia, Gustavo Pecho, and the Head of State of Honduras, Xiomara Castro, among others, participate in the event. On day two at the United Nations and Heads of State's Climate Summit COP27, the President of Colombia, Gustavo Pecho, advocated for global action on the reduction of hydrocarbon consumption as alternative to redress the planet's course. During his speech, the Colombian president warned that humanity faces total extinction if world politics does not overcome the climate crisis. Petro proposed a 10-step plan to face the situation. On the other hand, he recalled that the market is not the mechanism to overcome climate change because it was the capital accumulation that caused it and called to work in a public, global and multilateral planning that allows moving to a decarbonized world economy. The market is not the main mechanism to overcome the climate crisis. It is the market and the capital accumulation that cause it, and it will never be the solution. It is only public and global multilateral planning that allow us to move to a decarbonized world economy. The UN must be the stage for such planning. The Colombian president pointed out that blockade policies do not favor developing countries. The International Monetary Fund must initiate the program of debt for climate swap in all developing countries of the world. The policies of economic blockade do not favor democracy and go against humanity's time to act against the crisis. The President of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, held bilateral meetings with heads of state and world leaders in the framework of the United Nations and Heads of State Climate Summit COP27. The Venezuelan President met with the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, with whom he discussed the construction of a co progressive and multipolar world. Both leaders pledged to work for the joint benefit of the Caribbean peoples, as well as the strengthening of the Bolivarian Alliance for the peoples of our America People's Trade Treaty. President Maduro also met with his Suriname counterpart, Shan Santoki, to strengthen the strategic relations of both nations in energy and cooperation matters. During his COP27 speech, Vice President of Maldives, Faisal Nassim, warns his country's coral reefs are on life support. The ocean is our nation's source of nourishment and income. Each year, our fishermen need to travel further and further to find abundant fisheries. Unpredictable monsoon shifts have risen in frequency and intensity, causing storm surges and flooding that have had irreparable damage to property and livelihoods. Our coral reefs, drawing tourists from around the world, are on life support. And every single island has lost its freshwater supply, so we are dependent on technology to provide fresh water. Archbishop of Christos Thomas II, the outspoken leader of Cyprus, Greek Orthodox Christian Church, whose forays into the country's complex politics and finances fire up supporters and detractors alike, died on Monday at 81 years old. The Archbishop had suffered from intestinal liver cancer for the past four years and had spent his final days at the church headquarters in the capital. A medical bulletin said Christos Thomas II passed peacefully. The Holy Synod, the church's highest decision-making body, decided after convening on Monday that the Archbishop's body would lie in state at St. Barnabas Cathedral at the church headquarters in Nicosia, beginning on Thursday until his funeral on Thursday. Church bells across the country will ring in mourning throughout the funeral, while flags at all churches will be lowered to half staff for the next five days. 
In Italy, migrants and social organizations protest against the government's decree preventing the arrival of migrants. The right-wing government of Georgia Meloni, of Georgia Meloni, for more than 10 days, has maintained a closure of ports to NGO ships which rescue people coming from North Africa. In this context, different organizations and more than a thousand migrants on board of four ships that were left adrift after being denied landing in Italian ports protested against the government's measure. Protesters denounced the conditions of overcrowding, unhealthiness, and psychological stress after almost two weeks adrift. In Spain, doctors covering out-of-hospital emergencies in the community of Madrid went on indefinite strike. The Association of Doctors and Graduates of Madrid said the measure is intended to denounce the out-of-hospital emergency plan put in place to try to provide service in 78 new emergency centers without sufficient staff. Workers denounced the lack of health and cleaning material and criticized the working conditions regarding the number of hours and workplaces assigned without prior notice. This strike follows an order that lasted from Friday to Sunday after four unions that had signed an agreement in principle at the health sectoral table broke the pact. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Officials from the Ethiopian federal government and rebel authorities in the Terry region give a press conference in Nairobi in Kenya to discuss the implementation of the peace accord signed last week. The agreement for a lasting peace throughout a permanent cessation of hostilities should put an end to the war that has been raging in northern Ethiopia since November 2020 between Trigger rebels and the Ethiopian federal army and its allies. It is not the first time that both forces have sat at a negotiating table to try to put an end to the local conflict that has caused great damage among the civilian population which had been directly involved in the fighting. During the last month, the situation would have become much more violent, increasing the number of civilians killed, hunger, and social precariousness. The Prime Minister actually summoned regional presidents, ministers, political leaders, so that they would all embrace and do their best uh, now to reach out to the people in Tigray and also to, to embrace the peace process and give comfort for everybody but until the, the social transitional justice would begin, the healing process would begin, accountability process would kick in. Um, but what's most important is to reach out to the people to supply food and medicine. On the other hand, the spokesman of the People's Liberation Front of Tigray refers to the need for the peace agreements to be lasting this time and to be able to serve to resolve the conflict. So, uh, we may have overreached in terms of uh, giving too much details, uh, giving too much specifics about what can be done, what cannot be done, and it is time for the very people who have a deeper understanding of the reality on the ground to figure out how to go about it and to make sure that whatever we come up with is going to result in a lasting peace, not a publicity exercise where we may say we have agreed on a number of things only to, to renew on our promises and to do things that will set the club back. Kenya Airways canceled most flights Monday as a pilot strike entered its third day with thousands of travelers stranded and the government threatening disciplinary action if staff don't return to work. The pilots launched the strike at Nairobi's Jomo Kenyatta International Airport at 6 a.m. local time on Saturday, defying a court order against industrial action and leaving thousands of passengers stranded. The strike has exacerbated the wolves facing the troubled national carrier, which has been running losses for years despite the government pumping in millions of dollars to keep it afloat. Kenya Airline Pilots Association has not responded to the government warning but said earlier on Sunday that the strike would continue for the foreseeable future. Contrary to reports circulating that we have refused to negotiate, we would like to clarify that we have made all attempts to breach the gap between Kenya's management and ourselves. We have sent our proposals both to Kenya Airways and the concerned ministries on Friday, Saturday, and yesterday. This afternoon, we sent another proposal with even further concessions. Hundreds of young Congolese volunteers joined the army to fight the M23 rebels who are making increase in advances in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo.
In Goma, Dolphin Kibu, young men and women attended recruitment dives in the hope of getting the chance to be trained at the military academy and defend their country army. Officials say more than 3,000 applicants aged between 18 and 30 have registered across the province, in part as a response to a message to the nation by President Felix T. Sekedi calling on young people to enlist in the army to fight the M23 rebels. In Syria, U.S. forces illegally in the country looted on Sunday a new batch of oil from hydrocarbon fields in the northeastern region of Al Jazeera. In this regard, local media reported that at least 43 U.S. tankers carrying Syrian oil enter Iraqi territory through the illegal Al Mahmoudiyah crossing heading for their bases in northern Iraq. In response, the Syrian Minister of Oil and Natural Resources, Bassam Tomei, denounced that most of the oil fields in the northeastern region of Al Jazeera are occupied by the U.S. military and local separatist militia. The official also pointed out that U.S. forces are currently looting some 66,000 barrels of oil out of the 80,000 barrels produced daily by the nation. Thousands of Cameroonians gathered in the capital of Yonde to celebrate President Paul Pilla's 40 years in power. The Cameroon People's Democratic Movement was in charge of organizing the celebration across the country. After seven years as Prime Minister, the 89-year-old Cameroonian leader became head of state in 1982, replacing the country's first president, Amado Hajidjo, who resigned. Since then, President Pilla has not stopped winning elections, which the opposition has called fraudulent. The last elections took place in 2018, leading to President Pilla's seventh seven-year term in office. We have come to the end of this news from You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesforenglish.net. You can join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.